Hello everyone, it's Sam Herbert here and um, I'm going to give a lecture on how balance works in painting. Um, this lecture is titled Walking the Tightrope. Um, if we're going to talk about balance and painting, uh, the first thing we have to say is that balance is determined by uh, the play of visual forces uh, or perceptual forces within a painting. Um, so the first slide I've got here um, extenuates that by saying that visual forces are real. Uh, we have an intuitive visual understanding of balance and when presented with shapes we can assess whether something feels stable. These visual forces are perceptually and artistically real. They elicit in our brains the same phenomena as when we are confronted with physical phenomena. Uh, the same reaction as when we were confronted with physical phenomena, um, to which I would show you the illustration to the right of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Um, it is, um, looks very unbalanced and that elicits a reaction in us that, that we feel uncomfortable, or most people will feel uncomfortable when presented with that. Um, another example would be, say, the feeling of vertigo that people get when they're standing um, on a very, very high ledge looking down at something. You're not physically being affected by the force. It's actually your brain interpreting uh, the visual information that, that gives a very real effect to you. So in that respect, although it's only perceptual, it only happens in our eye, it does have an effect on our brain and it can affect our brain in a, in a or affect our brain can affect our body in um, a physical way. It, it can actually create um, a bodily effect. Another thing to say about balance is it's not a negation or a stagnation. Uh, dead center um, is misleading when you think about something being balanced. Um, it's actually the resolution of tensions. At best, it's a fine balancing of those tensions, like a taut rope in a tug of war or a tight rope, which is where the title of this um, lecture comes from. Why would an artist want balance? Well, an artist wants balance because it makes the statement unambiguous, his or her statement unambiguous. Um, balance is also needed in the broader context of bodily and mental well-being. Um, so we understand that, that if, if someone feels unbalanced, um, it's not really a good thing to be, that the idea of feeling balanced um, in both body and mind is something that's very important. So let's move on to how we assess balance in a painting. And a large factor that determines this is uh, the hidden structures of shapes. Um, every picture has a hidden structure and that's formed by an invisible axis. Um, the horizontal axis, which is running through the, the center from, from left to right, and the vertical axis, which runs through the center top to bottom, are the way we assess balance in composition. If you'll notice on this diagram, there's also two diagonal axes. Um, they aren't the dominant ones, so we aren't going to concern ourselves with them. So the, the, the two that we want to talk about are the vertical and the horizontal. Where these axes coincide is the position of maximum stability. And that is represented by the, uh, the kind of bullseye effect that's radiating out from there. As it goes out, it becomes less and less stable um, in, in moving along those axes. So ways of achieving balance um, using this structure. Well, the most obvious and basic way to create balance is to use symmetry. Um, architecture uses it a great deal, but you don't see it as much in painting. Uh, the reason for this is that overly symmetrical compositions can be monotonous, uh, they can lack visual complexity. Um, if they're used unimaginatively, like the uh, image to the right, which is quite a cheesy uh, thing that I found online, um, they really aren't going to give you much creative mileage as an artist, unless you can find ways to use it creatively. So symmetry is problematic in general for artists. Um, which must mean that there is a better way, and there is a better way, and that way is to work with asymmetry. 
So let's look at the power of um, asymmetry. So to, to, to give you an example of why asymmetry is valuable, I've got these two examples here. Disequilibrium or asymmetry makes forms unambiguous. And by that unambiguity, it makes them more visually powerful. They're more forceful, they're, they're more obvious. Um, look at the upper example. The left one is the more successful one. This is because the strong disequilibrium allows shapes to assert themselves visually. On the right, it's a weak resolution. Uh, the disequilibrium is ambiguous. The contrast between the shapes are weakly defined. Um, and it just looks, you're not quite certain if it's off center or uh, or it's centered. And, and that's problematic. Whereas in the one on the left, it's very, very clear. Another example is the two um, at the bottom on the right. Um, the left one again is the weaker one. The lines, it's it's got an incl it's inconclusive. The lines all seem to be st uh, stuck in the same size. Uh, the shape doesn't choose any of the options. It, it seems stuck in an in-between place. Um, look at the one on the right, the far right. There's a reassuring clarity due to the decisiveness of those differences. Now, these are just fairly obvious examples. They were, they were actually from a psychological test from the 1940s by Maitland Graves, an American um, professor. Um, how does this actually play out when it's used in painting? So we can now have a look at that in action. And it's a very powerful image by El Greco. Um, it's called Asymmetrical balance. Asymmetrical balance sets up tension and resolution. This has been used powerfully in Western painting. Its goal is to balance unequal forms across either the horizontal or the vertical, vertical axis. Compositions resolved in this way become much more visually satisfying due to their complexity. Now the image we've got here is by El Greco uh, of the Annunciation, one of several that he painted. Um, the strong disequilibrium is present in the difference in scale between the Archangel Gabriel to the right and the Virgin Mary on the left. This disproportion is satisfyingly resolved due to the use of counterbalancing factors in the composition to create tension. And uh, just to sort of quickly gloss over what that is, um, down the vertical axis, so the vertical axis runs here, and that's normally how we will make decisions about painting. So using the vertical axis, you can see there's a very, very strong um, disequilibrium. There's an imbalance between the two, but the image balances a whole. Why does it balance as a whole? Because of this area at the top. And actually, if you look at it, it's, it's a horizontal balance that El Greco has set up. It looks like it's to do with the vertical, but actually the true balance is between the top and the bottom. Um, the, the tension resolution is a very complex way of working. Also, if you look, you'll notice that the colors that are in the two figures at the bottom uh, repeat in the figures at the top. So the whole thing is knitted together um, in a triangle. So it's a very powerful, it's a very satisfying, it's complex, it's an interesting thing for the painter to deal with, it's interesting for a viewer to look at. Um, but what are the visual forces that we talk about when we talk about things balancing in a painting? And, and let, let's, let's unpick that and spend a bit of time going over what the main visual forces are that, that when you as a painter are trying to make these assessments, you have to go over. Um, the first one we've got, is white well there are two key principles um behind balance in painting they are weight and direction and those are the two things that we're going to spend the rest of this lecture talking about every element of a composition will feel the effect of these forces the color position and juxtaposition of the element will determine how they behave so to begin with let's look at visual weight Weight is one of the two key principles that affect pictorial equilibrium. Visual weight obeys the laws of gravity. There is a natural pull downwards. It feels like a struggle for elements to rise. To illustrate this, I've got El Greco again and his Pieta. Um, 
which is using a strong triangle shape to, of the figures to push upwards. The key here is, is to, to, to demonstrate that there is um, a, a feel of gravity, that it is harder for an object to rise. So the Virgin's head um, uh, pushing up beyond into the, into the upper second third of the painting, it looks like it is taking effort. Um, it, it, it's not easy, it feels harder, whereas it feels like everything is being irresistibly pulled downwards. The fact that her head is going upwards um, creates a real feeling of tension and effort. So there's, there's another example of what we're talking about with balance. Um, thinking now about how things um, are positioned um, with regards to um, the structural skeleton. So we go back to the, um, the, 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 the diagram that we began with, the, the square and the hidden structure. And very basically, um, you see that the position of an object on the surface within the, the rectangle of the square of the canvas um, has a very, very large bearing on how heavy it will appear. So the upper image, the upper right, um, shows strong positions on the structural skeleton. Anywhere close to the center or the horizontal and vertical axes can support a lot of weight. The lower one are weak positions. Anywhere off center or away from the central axis will not support much weight. Um, and you'll notice they're actually on the diagonal axis. And that's why I didn't really talk about them at the beginning because they're, they're, they're weaker um, pictorially the way that and perceptually, the way that weight operates on them is weaker. Um, putting this into practice again with, a, with another crude diagram rather than a painting, um, this is balanced. There's a, there's a balance in this, in, in this position here. This is because the central area can hold a lot of visual weight due to its position of stability. The weight of an element increases the further it moves from the center in exactly the same way as a lever works in physics. So the further it gets away from the center, the more force it can exert. Um, looking at the diagram, um, the balance between the three objects works. They, they hold themselves in balance. The reason that they do that, it, it should be that those smaller ones should be imbalanced against the larger one. But because the larger one is in an area that holds a lot of weight, it isn't um, disproportionately um, unbalancing the painting. That, that, that all you need to do to balance this, this, um, this diagram is to put two smaller elements in an area that's weak, therefore they'll be exerting much more uh, perceptual weight to counterbalance it. So it's a very simple crude example. Um, but if we look at some examples further on, you'll see how it does play out in, um, in real painting. So let's make it a bit more concrete and look at some examples. So the influencing factors, um, and I'm sorry, we've lost the bottom of, uh, of that, so I'll read it out. Um, size, so if all factors are equal, a larger object will always appear heavier. Um, another factor is isolation. A sun or a moon in an empty sky is heavier than a similar object surrounded by other things. Um, color will influence visual weight. Bright colors are heavier than darker dull ones. Red is heavier than blue. And if you look at uh, Monet's painting opposite of uh, the impression sunrise, um, that is to prove that, that the red is exerting a lot more weight than the blue. Other factors that we can look at is the depth of field. So that's spatial depth. Um, the greater the depth of field, the greater the weight an element that is placed there will carry. So we are illustrating this with Manet's Déjeuner Célèbre. Um, the figure at the back, who, who is, um, looks like she's kneeling, um, carries a lot of weight. She's counterbalancing the foreground figures. Um, the reason that she carries so much weight when she's actually so much smaller and, and less prominent than the other figures is because of the depth of field that she's set in, that she, she looks further back. 
It's interesting also, if you look at the shape that, that you've got this, then you've got this heavy area. So, so we understand that that is on a weak point. That is on a stable point. If we imagine those axes that we were looking at on the, on the square, that's a weak one. That's a strong one. And interestingly, although that is in a strong area, it's exerting a lot of weight. It, it's not a million miles away from what's going on there, is it? it? Except that we've moved that one down to there. The complication is, is that's no longer up there. But because it's on a stronger area, and also because it, it's in a depth of field, which is the complicating factor, it makes it heavier. So it, 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 it packs a bigger punch than it actually is. Um, other things that influence uh, visual weight, um, shape makes a big difference. Um, the regular shape of simple geometric figures will always look heavier. To illustrate that, we've got, again, a very basic diagram to the right. Um, the smaller circle counterbalances a larger rectangle and triangle because of this, because a circle um, is a very, what's well, the simplest shape that you can actually have. Um, compared to the other two, um, it is heavier. So you need more of them um, to be able to create a counterbalance. Another thing that we'll, we, can, we can talk about that will affect the visual weight, um, if we look at the rectangle and the triangle, uh, vertically oriented forms will seem heavier than oblique ones. So that means the rectangle will appear heavier than the triangle. Um, so when you look at that, the rectangle definitely feels like it's carrying a lot more weight than the triangle. But if you look at the whole thing as a composition, it does have a sense of uh, asymmetrical balance to it. Other things to think about is um, areas of intrinsic interest will increase the visual weight of an object. Um, this could be um, subject matter, it could be complexity, intricacy or any other peculiarity. So we return to Manet and observe the bouquet of flowers in Olympia. Um, it's very, very small relative to the painting, but it's got a very complex pattern um, within it. That complex pattern is creating an effective counterbalance to the head, which is, is one of the primary things that we're drawn to when we look at this painting. So to see how it's balanced, all you have to do is imagine that that bouquet wasn't there and you would start to notice that, that there are, there are problem, problems with um, how that image is balancing. So the intrinsic interest of that bouquet is creating an extremely effective counterbalance um, against the model's head. So that is um, a short tour of how visual weight um, works as one of the visual forces. And, and the second one, as I mentioned, is direction. So let's spend a bit of time looking at how direction affects balance in painting. Um, direction is the second key principle, as I, as I mentioned before. Um, pictorial equilibrium depends on forces compensating one another. The weight of neighboring elements affects the perception of direction. And to prove that, we have a diagram from um, a painting by Toulouse-Lautrec. Um, so the upper one, the horse feels like it is being attracted backwards due to the weight of the rider on top take the same horse, crop out the uh, rider and add a horse in front of it, it suddenly changes. The horse is attracted forward due to the weight of the other horse. Um, so it has a strong effect where things are placed in the direction that something th seems to be going on um, does definitely have an effect. It also has a very powerful effect on asymmetrical balance as well, which we, we will look at. So another thing about direction is there is a strong difference between top and bottom. Um, we did talk about this um, earlier with visual weight, talking about how it obeys the laws of gravity. And you saw in the Pieta by El Greco, it was hard for, it felt like there was a great effort for the Madonna's head to rise above the bodies below it. Um, but it also counts in terms of direction. The idea of descending and falling counts in balance. Um, objects are naturally attracted 
downwards. Um, enough weight at the bottom makes the object seem rooted, reliable and stable. Our normal perception is bottom heavy. Um, we are accustomed to seeing weight distributed lower down in our natural environment. Um, to prove this, um, all you need to do is take any landscape painting and turn it upside down and you'll see how odd that really does look. Um, if you talk about uh, unbalanced, it will look tremendously unbalanced. It'll look very sort of strange and wrong. Um, because we are accustomed to seeing things from the bottom. We have a bottom heavy vision. Um, to give you an example of that, look at the examples on the right. So on the, uh, the, the left column, the three, the B and the S, the, the right way up, um, they look perfectly normal to us. But actually, if you turn the same figures upside down, you notice that they are biased to the bottom. They are actually bottom heavy. When they're the normal way up, how we would normally read them, you don't notice that. It, it, it's, it's, it's something that we just compensate for. So very, very important to remember that um, it isn't just a matter of balancing um, something at the top with something at the bottom, um, that, that you have to make a compensation for it. Um, Rather than use a landscape painting, let's talk about a very famous abstract painting and, and show you how top and bottom um, uh, matter um, in, 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 in this example. Visually, an object of a certain size, shape, colour will carry more weight when placed higher in the picture. Um, therefore, horizontal balance cannot be achieved by simply placing equal objects at a different height. The higher object must appear lighter to visually balance um, with the lower one. Um, so have a look at Mondrian's compositions. Now the upper one is the correct, um, is the correct way up. That's the way Mondrian intended it. Mondrian was the master of creating balance, of, of, of making a bit like we were looking at with the, the three, the B and the S, you don't notice it. You, he creates a perfect balance between those forms. And, and again, the upper one, the red, the blue, the yellow, the, the negative space of the white and the blacks, it all seems to mesh together to create something that, that has a, an excellent sense of space and balance within it. Um, however, turn it upside down and you, you realize that the bottom carries more weight than the top. And that's not immediately obvious when you look at it um, the correct way up because Mondrian's very cleverly um, balanced the, the, the big red square against the blue and the yellow and, and the, the shapes at the bottom. So moving on with direction, so that's top and bottom. Now let's talk about left and right because that's really important because a lot of the, the assessments we make are along the vertical axis. So left and right does have a very, very big role to play in a symmetrical balance. Here we have um, an example to show how we read pictures from left to right um, and that asymmetry, a symmetrical balance, lateral asymmetry, i.e. things from, from one side aren't balanced with the same, it's very, very noticeable in paintings, particularly if you mirror them, if you, you turn them the wrong way around. Uh, this is very vividly um, explained, uh, giving you an example of Raphael's Sistine Madonna. You can see how well it's balanced asymmetrically because once you reverse it, the left to right bias of how we view things and, and the, the, the importance of direction is revealed because suddenly the one on the right looks very awkward. It, it feels very strange, doesn't it? Um, compared to the one on the left um, is a very vivid explanation of how um, asymmetrical balance works, that, that you, you have to make compensations for it. And, Raphael has done that in an extremely sophisticated way, um, how he's got the whole of the elements to, to hold it together. Other things to talk about uh, with left and right. So, so just to go into a bit more detail about um, why that happens is um, because of this. Um, 
we are accustomed, at least um, in, 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 in Western writing systems, to read from left to right. I'm, I'm not actually sure what it means for cultures that don't read in that direction, but we, we can only talk about um, um, European painting um, in, in, in this example. So we read things naturally from, or we're accustomed to read things from left to right. What that means is, is that perceptually the left is the more central side. Um, it's actually more important. It, it appears larger to us um, and we will identify it, that the emphasis, per, uh, it comes because it's the first thing that we generally will encounter and we have a strong identification with it. The right is usually the bit that you arrive at after you've moved from the left through to the right. Um, objects on this side are more conspicuous and being on the right will actually make an object appear heavier. And again, if you look back at Raphael, you can see that's in play because the, the, the smaller figure on the right, once that figure goes onto the left, it doesn't work because there's a compensation between the larger uh, cloaked figure and the female figure. Um, that they're, they're actually balancing each other, even though they're, they're completely different sizes and they feel very different in weight. An example of the direction movement is in Grunewald's uh, Eisenheim altarpiece. Um, on the left, Mary and the Evangelist, or rather the, the that Mary and the Evangelist hold the center of importance for Christ. So, so there are three things that are very important. You have a swooning virgin, Christ obviously in the middle, and uh, the Evangelist on the right. Um, when you look at John the Baptist um, on the right, he's, he's very conspicuous in it, but he's not the most important one. If you read the symbolism of what's going on, um, the left to right movement and bias um, becomes very clear in this one. Um, so as I said, it feels natural for us to read an image from left to right. Um, right to left movements are associated with more effort, visually that is. Um, it's this similar to what we were talking about, about the effort needed to go to, to defy gravity and rise up the, the, the painting. To give you an example of this, there's a painting by Goya um, called Snowstorm in Winter. Um, the direction they're moving in is they're moving from right to left, so that is giving a sense of effort. It's harder to do, it feels wrong, everything, um, it feels like they're walking in wind and snow and cold and um, it's taking an awful lot of effort. It really feels that Goya has used the power of direction to extenuate that. At the bottom, we have um, a very famous by, um, painting by Titian called The Death of Actium. Um, and what we have is that it's Diana firing an arrow at him while the hounds um, kill poor Actium. Um, it creates an incredible sense of movement and direction. Our eye moves like Diana's arrow um, from her to Actium. And that is extenuated again by taking advantage of the, the left-right direction, that, that we enter through the left and we move through to the right. Um, Titian has done a lot of other things that are um, very clever within that, that are um, helping to accentuate that but it, it follows all the rules that we have spoken about um, within this, this lecture and finally as a kind of coda I want to talk about intentional imbalance now imbalance itself is only undesirable if it was unintentional um, because it weakens the power of the visual statement so if you don't mean to do it you don't really want that to be happening if you're trying to balance it however when you use it intentionally, it can create unsettling compositions that feel deliberately unstable, allowing the artist to access a range of expressive possibilities. So there's an example of a Philip Guston painting there that it breaks every rule 
of what we've just been talking about, actually. So he knew full well what he was doing. He was an extremely um, well-versed painter, that, that he understood the old masters uh, deeply. And all of his paintings are infused with a, a real depth of knowledge of, of just the craft and the art of putting a painting together. So he is deliberate. It isn't, it isn't bad um, form on his part. He knows he's exactly breaking all of those rules um, quite deliberately to create a very unsettling, difficult composition. And finally, I'm going to leave you with these images. I think it's quite appropriate on a, on a, uh, a lecture called Walking the Tightrope to End with a Tightrope Walker. Um, and it's also a good example of an un, of, of intentional balance by Paul Clay. And another one that is a, a favourite of mine is one of Goya's black paintings in the Prado in Madrid um, called The Dog. Sometimes it's called The Drowning Dog, but usually people just refer to it as The Dog. So that is how balance works in paintings. That's the theory of it. Now you've got to do it in practice. And um, I very much look forward to seeing what you um, are able to produce. Um, thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.